This is the West Concord Sermon Podcast. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you receive a blessing from today's message. Amen. You may be seated. And we are back in the book of Revelation this morning. And as we kind of pick up where we left off, we were in chapter 12 last time. Just as a reminder, a refresher of the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 3 speaks of the churches that John was ministering to. It speaks of Christ in the midst of the churches, what he expects from them and how many of them let him down. And then as we project ahead in chapters 4 through 18, where we're sort of in the middle of that right now, we move ahead to future times where we see a period of great tribulation that Daniel told us about, that even Jesus in Matthew 24 told us about. Great tribulation, great difficulty. When God will one day judge the Gentile nations and Israel who rejected Him. And because God is just, He must bring horrendous judgment. During that time, humanity will fully realize a godless society. We hear a lot of talk about pride this month. Let me remind you that it was pride that was the very first sin that caused Adam and Eve to stumble and the fall of humanity to occur. And pride, as it rears its head again, will lead this world away from God into a godless state, to an atheistic regime that will rise up And as we read through the book of Revelation, we see the results of that. So it is difficult. It's very dramatic. It's very difficult. When we get to chapter 19, we'll see the second coming of Christ, and then we'll see what will transpire through eternity after that. But as we enter chapter 13 this morning, we're sort of in that mid part of the seven years of tribulation. We're coming to the place and have actually introduced it the place that Daniel and Jesus both referred to as the period of great tribulation. Daniel specifically called it the time of Jacob's trouble. It is during that time when this Antichrist that you've heard about will rise to power, when the ultimate godless human leader will come on the scene, seeking to be worshipped above God giving visible and tangible evidence of the satanic trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, as we dive into this, many people oftentimes like to nitpick details and second-guess scriptures. We're not going to do that this morning. Often when the subject of prophecy and end times comes up, people say, well, when's the rapture going to happen? When's the Antichrist? Where is all this stuff? Let me, let me share with you something from Augustine, St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa in the uh, fourth century. Speaking of naming names and dates, especially dates when Christ has come or the last day, he says this. He says, the last day is every day may be regarded. You see, because oftentimes people get all titillated and twisted about prophecy. When's the rapture? Who's the Antichrist? When's Jesus coming back? And we look so far in the future that we forget to live for Christ today. We forget that we have a mission today. Aaron mentioned our Sunday school lesson in Mark 8. We have people in need today. I'll tell you when Jesus is coming back. I I have no problem doing that. He's coming back when he comes back. How's that? We nailed it. Go home and tell your friends. The reality is, for many of us, Jesus may come back at any time, as life is not guaranteed on this earth. I've already lost some friends this week that have passed on to eternity. Instead of worrying about who the Antichrist is, and we're going to talk about this individual this morning, but I'm not going to give you names and details. The reason why is the scriptures, they don't do that. And to do that is dishonesty with the scriptures. And we're going to be honest with the scriptures. If you remember what uh, Dr. Palmer, who are, we've quoted him several times, a revelation scholar, he says, it's better to be lean in our interpretation than luxurious. 
because we start inserting our own ideas. What we're going to see this morning is an individual who rises upon the scene, and this is going to happen. We know this is going to happen. The reason why is because all the promises already given by God have been met. Why shouldn't we expect him not to let this be fulfilled as well? And as we look at this chapter and as we, as we lay out the unholy trinity, we need to be reminded of one special important thing this morning. And that thing is simply this. We have no hope in human government. Whether it's Republican, Democrat, Socialist, Communist, all human government, while it sometimes is necessary for the policing of human morality, Jesus has said much, God through Paul has said as much in Romans 13, Peter in 1 Peter has said as much. We need to obey government, we need to honor government, we need to obey the laws. Up until government asks us to do things that are unbiblical, ungodly, and immoral, then we can rebel. But understand this, one day God is going to be pushed out completely from our culture, and God is going to allow that to happen. And all those who hold to godlessness, atheism, pride, will see their hopes and dreams fulfilled. But unfortunately, it's not going to be the utopia that they want. It's going to be more like the dystopia that is often portrayed in Hollywood movies today. Our goal this morning is to divorce our trust in human government and transfer that trust to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So as we get into prophecy and continue, and don't worry about days and names and dates. The Bible doesn't give those, and I'm not going to. Be concerned about today. What are you doing for Christ today? Do you know Christ today? What a wonderful message we heard in Sunday school. Go out and meet somebody's need today. Be God's conduit to do that. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Revelation chapter 13. We'll read the first section. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. This is John under the inspiration of God's Spirit. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority." And I saw one of his heads as if it were, as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months or three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in in heaven. It was granted for him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given over him given him over every tribe, tongue, and all nations. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So as we get into chapter 13, we see two individuals described here. Both of them, as we're going to see in a little bit, both of them called a beast. And there's a necessary reason for that. Because humanity was created in the image of God. And when you know Christ as Savior, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. So that then you may be imitators of Christ in God. We ought to be spiritually minded and not earthly minded. But several places in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, Scriptures allude to the fact that when we turn our backs upon God we begin to act like the brute beasts around us. And so these individuals who will one day be the fulfillment of the hopes and dreams of atheistic and prideful people will rise to the top. 
He is the beast from the sea, as we will see. Why does he call him the beast from the sea? Well, according to Scripture, as we look at different places, as you know, geography, the nation of Israel was on the Mediterranean Sea. The Holy Land, the land of promise, was there abutted by the Mediterranean Sea. And whenever there were people that came over across the sea, the Gentiles who would come and harass them, come and and, and just give them a hard time, they would come through the Mediterranean Sea. And oftentimes that sea is a typology of the Gentile peoples of the world. That out of the sea come the invaders. Out of the sea come the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. We are Gentiles. Unless you're here this morning and I don't know that you're Jewish. God bless you. And so this beast that will rise up will seem to come out of Gentile nations. We know him by the name of Antichrist, but that name really isn't used in Scripture for this individual, but in 1 John. When we went through 1 John, we saw that. He is the embodiment of what the Apostle John there called the spirit of Antichrist. Now understand this about the devil. There is a real devil. There is a personal devil. There is a powerful devil. He existed in eternity past as Lucifer, the grand and glorious archangel of God. But because he was prideful and wanted to be like God, he was judged and cast out from heaven. His main crime was pride. He wanted to be like God. You can read about this in typology in Ezekiel 28. You can go to Isaiah 14. Where he said, I will be like God. I will sit on his throne. I will sit in the holy place. But God cast him out. He is the enemy that we have. Again, we have no other enemies but the devil as believers. Unsaved people, they're not our enemies. Atheists, other religions, other politics, those, those aren't our enemies. We have one enemy. And that is the devil. He was cast down, but his desire is to be like God. And he seeks to deceive humanity and draw people away from the true God. And one day he will realize his dream. He will seek to be like God, even in a holy, an unholy rather, trinity. He's mentioned in this passage as the dragon. An appellation that's used of Satan very often in scripture. He is the dragon, the serpent. We see the Antichrist, the beast out of the sea, and a little bit later we'll see the false prophet. You have the dragon acting and aping God. You have the beast, Antichrist, aping Christ. And you have the false prophet aping and acting like the Holy Spirit. You see, oftentimes skeptics and people who claim to be atheists, they want to push away supernatural issues, but they can't. They can push away God. God's not going to go. But there are also fallen supernatural powers that exist. And the more this nation, this world recedes from God, the more evident these things become. Until when we get to the middle of this tribulation period, we've already seen numerous judgments occur. And they've been difficult and they've been harsh and horrendous. But as we move into these last three and a half years, there is a reason why Daniel calls this time period the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the people of God will be harassed. The people of God will be persecuted. Not only the Jews, but the church, the saints. Actually, the church is gone, but the saints who are there. The believers, Jew and Gentile. He will harass these people. And this is going to be this world leader. But we call him the Antichrist. And yes, John does use that term for him in 1 John. And again, I'm not going to sit here today and I'm not going to say, I'll tell you who the Antichrist is. There's a good reason for that. I don't know. And the Bible does not reveal it. When I was in Bible college, it's amazing how people like to speculate and guess. I'll never forget when I was in Bible college, one group was, was really bent up about the fact that they believed that the Antichrist, wait a minute, hold on, was Jimmy Carter. That's the same reaction I had. Now, whether you like Jimmy Carter as a president or not, and God bless him, he's up in years and everything, but I just have a hard time seeing the Antichrist with a big smile and a peanut in his hand. I just don't see that happening. 
And then there was, of course, probably the more conservative group in school. They thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. Well, okay. Because Ronald Reagan, Ronald Wilson Reagan, you know what? Six letters in each name. That didn't happen. And the reality is, as we're going to see in a little while, our grandparents had different despots in their lives, they thought. And everybody thought they got it nailed. They have, we have him. And the reality is, we don't know who he is. And if the rapture, the catching away of the church does come, we're not going to know, we're not going to see him. He is yet to be revealed. And here's the thing. Don't spend your time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. Spend your time getting to know the real Christ. That's what you should be doing. But nonetheless, we need to know some particulars about this individual, even if we can't know specifics. First of all, it talks about his appearance. Notice he came rising up out of the sea, out of the Gentile nations, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this is going to be a human person, but this imagery is given as interesting. Seven is the number of completion of leadership, and it's interesting because Rome, at the time of writing this letter, when John was still living... The city and empire of Rome had sway over the known world at that time. And it's interesting that Rome was built on seven hills. And that's very well known geographically. Rome was built on seven hills. It says he had seven heads and ten horns. Horns were symbolic of leadership in Scripture. The Bible says, according to Daniel, at the end times, the last days, there will be a ten-nation confederacy that seems to rise up out of the West. And some Bible scholars believe that it, it is a revival of the Roman Empire. And there's no reason really to doubt that. Rome never died, by the way. The Roman Empire fell in 476 A.D. in the West, but in the East, Rome continued. The Roman Empire actually lasted until 1806. And then when it finally crumbled, it was called then the Holy Roman Empire. And the emperors were Germanic and French. And they still claim to be Romans. As a matter of fact, Europe today, the national names of Europe, Spain, France, Germany, and all of these names, they still maintain the Roman uh, nomenclature. So the Roman Empire never actually died. It simply faded away, in a sense. And some Bible scholars, and I am one of them, believe that this is a kind of a revival. This whole thing will be led by Europe and maybe the European common market, but nations come and go in that. There aren't necessarily just ten. That's why I say don't get excited about the details and don't worry about it. But this beast will rise up. He'll be representative of all these Gentile nations that have come before. Seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. And on his head's a blasphemous name which God chooses not to share with us. And again, we iterate, this is, the, it, this is the culmination of all Gentile world empires when he says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. If you go back and read Daniel chapter 7, you'll see the Gentile world powers as they progress described in much the same way. But interestingly enough, John does the list backwards here because John is looking back from his time period. The lion was Babylon. The bear was Media Persia. The leopard was Greece. And the great, great beast was Rome. But now John, in the end of the first century, is looking back, describes them in reverse. Again, this great fulfillment of these Gentile powers, this is what this man, this individual will be. And it says his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And notice his energizer. We see his appearance. This is sort of an imagery. This sort of describes the fact that he, he's not going to have all these physicality uh, descriptions going on, but he is going to be the ultimate, complete ruler of what has been building up in the Gentile empires. So that's his appearance. Again, nothing specific. What about his authority? Well, he's got to have some power. Well, look where it comes from. Verse, uh, as we finish verse 2, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. He will, be, he will be empowered by the devil himself. Don't, don't, listen, don't minimize, don't maximize the devil. The devil is not equal and co-equal with God. That's what some people get messed up with. Duality. They feel like it's like Star Wars, like the force, the dark inside and the, and the light side. No, no. 
God is ultimately King of kings, Lord of lords, and all-powerful, but the devil himself is powerful. Yet he is a created being. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But he will energize and empower this grand and great world ruler who is the culmination of all the hopes and dreams of the godless Gentile world powers that have come on before and still exist today. And so it says that he will have the authority given to him by the devil himself. And then it seems like there, there's something else that happens. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Some Bible scholars, as they read this, seem to think that this individual, as he rises up, will appear to be assassinated and then come back and rise again. Now, that's a possible and plausible interpretation because think of the devil. His job and his desire is to counterfeit everything about God. Religion today is the devil's counterfeit of Christianity. And one day this Antichrist will be raised and empowered and he will be the Antichrist, the, the counterfeit of Christ. And remember, Christ died, was buried, and what? Rose again from the dead. And perhaps the devil puts on this show to allow this individual to look like he has been risen and raised like Christ. I don't know. It seems to indicate something like that. Some teach that, yes, this is speaking of the fact that the Roman Empire has died but never truly died and rose again and one day will rise again one day. Again, we're simply interpreting Scripture. It is written. You need to be careful not to get too specific in things like this because God has chosen not to. And so there's a possible assassination. We also go to his adulation. This, whatever happens, he will be somebody who will come on the scene, a charismatic leader, and he will capture the attention of the world. And listen, this is why we know this is yet to come, because in biblical days there was not the infrastructure for this to be able to happen. Rome, yes, was the leader of the world at that time, but listen... There is also to the very far east, the nations of Asia, the empires of China and Japan. To the west, there were Native Americans, they were natives and they're, they're all, you know, the Middle East is just a portion, even the European section is the continent is just a portion of the world. But one day the Bible seems to indicate that this grand ruler and his kingdom and his influence will reach across the world. Now we have that capacity with internet and digital aspects. I mean, you can, you can jot a note and send somebody a letter and they'll receive it within seconds today. Today you can Zoom and chat and FaceTime with people in, in China. Today. News is now global. We just had the tragic story of the submersible around the Titanic. All the world knew that and were hoping and grieving at the same time. So it's not hard to imagine that somebody today could capture the love and attention of the entire world, especially if they are supernaturally empowered and perform miracles as Christ did. So just keep that in mind as you're looking. This is yet future. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? He will receive worldwide acclaim, worldwide adulation. According to Daniel, it says he will come upon the scene and seem to bring peace in the Middle East. He will sign a contract with uh, the Jews and those Arabs that are warning, warring against them. He will literally bring peace to the Middle East, which is one reason why evidently he'll rise to power. I mean, can you imagine that one man or woman who does come to bring peace in that horrible region of the world? They will receive adulation and honor. But it'll be a tenuous contract, according to Daniel. Daniel said it'll be a weak rope. But nonetheless, he will, be, he will also be a friend to the Jews for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Daniel refers quite a bit to him. He calls him the abomination of desolation. He was referred to here as the beast. John, again, calls him the Antichrist in another letter. And as we'll see a little bit later on, he's called the lawless one because he does not honor God. So he will be worshipped. He will receive worldwide acclaim and adulation. And of course, this will foster his arrogance. It says in verse 5, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. 
Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. He is going to be the epitome of godlessness. Today, it seems like more and more in our culture today and in the world's culture seems to speak out and blasphemes against God. To pillory God, to mock God. Well, he will be the embodiment of this kind of attitude. He will then do that in all of his arrogance. It goes on finally to describe his activities. As we pick it up, it says it was granted to him in verse 7 to make war with the saints. Saints are all those who have believed on Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. If you're here and you know Christ as Savior, you're a saint. Which is a, basically a root word for someone who is holy, sanctified, and set apart. You've been set apart by your salvation. He makes war with all of God's people to overcome them. And authority was given over every, look at this, every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. We have the technology today that will make that possible. All those whose names and all those who worship him, they are whose names have not been written in the book of life, uh, book of, life of the Lamb. What is that book? The book of life is mentioned several times in Scripture, and it seems to be the book of life is what it is. When you were, when you were born, you were in the book of life. All those who are alive. How many people are alive today? Raise your hand. Okay, this is not weekend at Bernie's. We're all alive. If you're alive, your life and your name is written in the book of life. But according to other places in Scripture, when you reject Christ as your Savior, if God forbid you've done that, I hope everybody knows him, your name, if you die in that condition, you become blotted out of the book of life. When you reject Christ, you become blotted out of the book of life. And those will be who, re, who will worship him. Those who are not in the book of life slain of the lamb, slain the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. God provided salvation. Even before the world was created, God, he didn't create a perfect world, but he did create a perfect way in Christ. So right there you have the generalities, the descriptions of this individual. And I am purposely not going to get up here and name names and dates. Who could it be? Who might it be? Could he be alive today? Could he not? I don't know. I don't know. And I'm not going to do that. Because the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't do that. So again, let me encourage you as we talk about this individual, don't get caught up in trying to figure out who the Antichrist is, focus your attention on the true Christ. Learn about him. Get to know him. Don't worry about when things are going to happen. Focus on today. Make things happen for Christ in your life and the life of your family today. But understand what is coming. Understand what this world is heading for. And again, you can see the symptoms of it in our culture. Now, I'm not trying to disparage any individual, but Pride Month is a horrible thing. Because it's not just a smack against the LGBTQ community, homosexuality, and so forth and so on. Those things are sinful and immoral in the eyes of God. But any kind of pride, I see some people putting up straight pride. Don't do that. Straight pride, white pride, black pride, male pride, female. Pride is the problem. No matter what hyphen you put with it. It is pride that caused humanity to fall in the garden. It is pride that keeps people away from God. No matter who they are. Straight, gay, white, black, male, female, rich, poor. There should be nothing that we celebrate with pride. That is the original and the most horrendous sin. But you see people pushing away from God... Because what does pride do? It focuses on ourselves. It focuses on me. That's what Satan did. Satan said, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be God. I'm going to sit in his throne. I'm going to be the boss. Pride is what it is. So that is the Antichrist who has come. That's all really we need to know. That's all God chose to reveal to us. The individual who will ultimately and fully personify the godless system of human government. 
And what you and I need to be aware of is the culture around us that is pushing us in that direction. But he won't be in this alone. There's another beast. Let's skip down for a minute. We'll come back to verse 9. But let's skip down to verse 11. John said, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all authority over the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performed great signs so that even <clears throat> he performed great signs so that he, he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, mimicking maybe Elijah the prophet. And it deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to, to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would, as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. And no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number of the man, his number is 666. Oh my goodness, that has caused so much speculation, so much discussion. Now understand this as we talk about this whole future tyrant and this whole dynamic and this entire government control of humanity, so much so that you can't move, buy, sell without government permission through a mark or through some sort of sign. This is not anything that's new. As a matter of fact, Paul tells of this time in 2 Thessalonians. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. What is a falling away? That word falling away is one Greek word. It means apostasia. That's the Greek word, and we get our English word apostasy from that. What is apostasy? Somebody becomes an apostate when they embrace God, they embrace the faith, and then turn away. They become an apostate. And according to Paul, in the latter times, in the last days, there will be a great apostasy that will happen. In other words, many will turn from the God that perhaps they once embraced. Many will turn from the God that their culture embraced. And I tell you, we do see that happening today. If you look at the Gallup numbers and the Barna polls, you'll find that even... Regular church attendance, belief in the Bible, belief in Christ as death, burial, and resurrection has dropped in some points 25 to 30 percent. In the United States, we are becoming more and more ungodly. We are moving away from God. More and more people are calling themselves nuns. God's word. The apostasy, the falling away, he says, those will, that, that will come first. And yeah, we do see that happening. And then it says, and then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he sits, in, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's referring to the dictator we are calling the Antichrist. And again, people say, well, how could that ever happen? Well, it's happened before, but not on a worldwide scale. We've had dictators and despots come onto the scene. The best known one in recent American history is Adolf Hitler, who rose up in Germany and very nearly took over the Western Hemisphere. Quite frankly, very nearly did that. We know, and he was a dry run. We have other despots in our world today. We see them out there. Joseph Stalin was one such individual. Some of these guys, Benito Mussolini, the father of fascism. And we can name them today. They just nearly had a coup in Russia as a, as a rebel, rebellious group nearly took Vladimir Putin down this past week. The difference between John's time and even the times of these people was there was no worldwide infrastructure 
for a leader to actually take influence over the world. But it can happen. Oh, you've been watching too many spy shows and science fiction dramas. No, no. It seems our world is heading in that direction. A global economy. Global government. I'm not talking about gloom and doom stuff, and I'm not telling you it's going to happen tomorrow. I'm just saying the stages are being set, and God in Christ, God and Paul here prophesies this. Christ also speaks in Matthew 24 of the one that Daniel calls the abomination of desolation. Daniel speaks quite a bit about this individual. This is not something that should be sloughed off or ignored as some kook controversy. Again, I'm not going to tell you names and dates or name anybody. I don't know. But I will tell you this is coming and this is the fulfillment of Scripture and the fruition of godless government. So let's look at this beast. This beast is from the earth, coming up out of the earth. Nothing spiritual about this individual. He will be a false prophet. Just like the Spirit of God dwells in believers to convict the world, according to the book of John, of sin, righteousness, and judgment, to bring light and to, and to, and, and to bring uh, illumination. The Spirit of God filling believers in the church age did wondrous miracles and provided signs to affirm the messages and the messengers. So this false prophet will come as the spokesperson for the Antichrist. And the Bible says, if you'll notice, it says in verse 11 that he has two horns like a lamb. One can infer from that that he will come with some religion. He will have a religious aspect about him. How that look, I don't know. But there will be a religious aspect about him and he will promote and propagate the dragon and the, and the beast that rises out of the sea, the Antichrist. It says in verse 13, he performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sign side of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. So we see a few things about this man as we read scripture. We see his mission is to promote the beast and the dragon to promote the adulation of them, to promote the respect for them. He will be the front man. He will be the promoter. He will be the false prophet. And he will accompany this with miraculous deeds and miraculous acts. He will do all kinds of things, even calling fire from heaven. He will be doing this to say, look, Christianity had its Christ, but this is the real thing. That's what his message is going to be. Not only that, but he will some way make an image of the beast and it will be able to speak and to talk. And I'm thinking, man, we have AI technology. We have holographic technology, AI technology. We have amazing things. If you go to Disney World, I've been to Disney World. I grew up near Disney World. Went more than I'd like to tell you. And it gets hot at Disney World. On Christmas Day, it could be hot. And that tells you there's the best place to go in, when it's hot in Disney World is going to the Hall of Presidents. You say, that's boring. Yeah, but it's cool. <laughs> and it's calm. And so when you've ridden all the rides and the mountains and the death-defying things and everything, I go in the Hall of Presidents and I just go, <sighs> and you see all these animatronic presidents of the United States talking to each other. They're laughing, picking their nose. I don't know, they're doing something. And then one of the presidents, whoever the current president is, stands up and gives a speech and it's amazing what they can do. This kind of technology is now available today. This kind of technology happens today. And the false prophet will evidently make use of this. And he talks about the mark. Now, this is the thing that gets people all jacked up and ginned up and excited. Oh, the mark of 666. I think it's interesting, all the things that I've read, even just in studying for this sermon today. But all through the years that I've been saved, all the speculation. Jimmy Carter, really? Ronald Wilson Reagan, 666. Even in John's day, they were trying to figure it out. It's Caligula. It's Nero. Some in my parents' and grandparents' day, Hitler was the Antichrist. All those have fallen short. So what does it mean? Well, in the end times, this individual and his false prophet will have such a grip on the world economy that there'll be some sort of way that you can do business. You cannot buy or sell unless you have this mark. What will it be? I don't know. My dad, who was an electronics technician, after he got saved, was reading this. He said, let me give you my thought on it. I thought, oh, here we go. So dad said, you know what? He said, son, everything is digital. 
And back when he was doing this, now again, this is 30 years ago or more, he said, he said that most, you know, things, computer numbers are 18 digits. He said there are a lot of computer things that he dealt with as, as he was an electronics technician for the FAA. He said they come out in 18 digits, three sets of six. He said, imagine taking your phone number, your social security, and maybe your address or another number, and then setting that up as your ID number. And then somehow implanting that in a chip in your hand or forehead wadded, I don't know. And that when you go buy something, all you got to do is weigh your hand under the scanner. Or let them scan your forehead. Back in the, even before the 70s, they had no opportunity or ability to do this. Now you can do it. We have tap cards. We have Apple Pay. We have all this stuff. And I'll be honest with you, wouldn't it be convenient to have that like that? You wouldn't have to carry your wallet anymore. You go and buy your groceries and boop, you go and you're on your way. You know, that sounds, I hate self-checkout. How many of y'all hate self, I hate self-checkout. Every time, every time I go to the self-checkout thing, something goes wrong. And I got to call the pit boss over to help me get it right. I hate self-checkout. I'd rather do an individual person. I like people better. But you know how convenient that will be. I'm just speculating you could take it or leave that. But for somehow, some way, if you have this mark, you can do business. If you don't have this mark, you will not be able to buy, sell, or do business. And again, you're going to have a worldwide government run by this individual. So we go down to verse 18 and said, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Oh, I can already hear your little heads going out there. I know who it is, Brother Mike. I sat down last night and calculated it out. Did you? I'd like to hear what your answer is. Because I don't know who it is. So what does this mean, 666? I'll tell you, I've read every commentary I think that has been written to get the sense. And I tell you, the best sense I've gotten is from a Bible scholar by the name of Dr. John Walvoord. He was a prophecy scholar, and he was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's gone home to be with the Lord, probably one of the most prestigious Bible scholars of the late 20th century. And this is what he said about this number. He said, probably the best interpretation is that the number six is one less than the perfect number seven. God created the earth in six days, rested on the seventh. God is represented in the, earlier in the book of Revelation. Seven lampstands, seven lamps. Seven seems to be the number of perfection, the number of God. And it says, and the threefold repetition of the six would indicate that for all their pre pretensions to deity, in other words, all their boasting and bragging, the beast and the false prophet, he goes on to say Satan and his two beasts were just creations and creatures and not the creator. In other words, Dr. Walvert is saying maybe the number six, because humanity was created on the sixth day, and the number of humanity seems to be six. And, and Daniel's vision, when he saw the great statue, it was, it was uh, the dimensions were multiples of six. Maybe it's God's way of saying, look, when this man comes on the scene and he seems dynamic and, and he seems deific and he seems powerful, remember, he's just a man. And Satan, the grand dragon, is just a creation. They fall short. They fall short. Is that the proper interpretation? I don't know, but it seems reasonable to me. Because I certainly don't think you, me, or any other scholar today can point to one man or woman and say, this is the Antichrist. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to get up here and tell you who it is or who I think it is. And please don't ask me in the foyer. Because I'll make up something just to give you a hard time. So for now, this is the interpretation I'm hanging on to because it makes a little sense. And maybe during this time when all of this stuff comes to fruition, there will be reasons why sixes make more sense. But for right now, this makes sense to me. So at the end of the day, listen, you have a time coming where the world is going to be roiling in judgment and struggling in Gentile apathy and apostasy. There's going to be a time when the people of this planet reject God outright and out of that will come this great despotic world ruler. Who will be the, he will, he will be the fruition of the dreams of the atheist. He will be a godless ruler. But he will be a despot because here's the thing. When you don't allow divine morality to play out, then everybody makes up the rules. 
and their own rules not only often are, are flawed, flawed, but if you don't obey their rules, they'll come after you. Back over to verse 9. I skipped this on purpose. Because as John was writing this, he wanted to encourage not only the saints that, was re receiving, that were receiving the letter he was writing, but also the saints who would read this one day within this whole ordeal. And he says this in Revelation 13, 9. He says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Let me translate in modern Concord, North Carolina. Listen. Listen. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. And he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. In other words, troublemakers will bring trouble on themselves. Bullies will be bullied. Murderers will be murdered. The Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, even the devil himself is not going to get away with it all at the end. The old saying, what goes around will come around. He said, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, be patient, have faith. All that is wrong will be made right. All that is unjust will be made just. And those who persecute and bully and perse pers you know, push people around, they will one day be dealt with. People of God, hey, listen, we need to hear that today, don't we? And they will need to hear that then. So here's the final word on the subject. Why, why is this in here? Because God does not want us to put trust in human government. We've got another election coming in 2024. We've got a country that is a mess. We have numerous men and women promising to fix this mess. I've been around the planet for plus 60 years. I've heard a lot of men and women promise to fix the mess. Guess what? Still a mess. I have to go back to what Chuck Colson, Chuck Colson, who was on the cabinet of Richard Nixon, Chuck Colson, who went to prison because of his, his work in Watergate and while in prison came to know Christ as his savior. And when he was released from prison, went on to have a teaching ministry that was amazing. Chuck Colson said this, and I told you this back in the book of, when we studied Daniel, the answer to the ills of this country will not fly in on Air Force One, but was nailed to the cross of Calvary, buried and rose again. Chuck Colson, who worked in the bowels of a corrupt government, realized this. You and I need to realize this. The Democrats aren't the answer, but nor are the Republicans the answer. Men and women taking office, we pray for good men and women, we vote for good men and women, but if you're trusting in a president, a prince, or a potentate to make your life better, again, God is telling us don't trust in humans to do that. You and I are answerable to God. We must place our confidence in God, in Christ. No matter who sits in the White House, the State House, or your house, that's where it counts. So as we think of this Antichrist, many people get scared. I'm not scared. A, if God's word is true, I'm not going to be here. And here's the thing. I don't want anybody else to be here either. You and I, instead of getting all twisted up about politics and parties and presidents, we need to get twisted up about people who without Christ will die and go to hell. Or who will die without Christ during this ungodly, horrible period. I do care who becomes president. I will vote, but at the end of the day, that's not the end of my life. Because whoever sits in the White House, my allegiance is to God who sits on the throne of the universe. So there is an antichrist coming. There is a beast coming. This stuff is, is going to happen. Our job is not to worry about that last day. Our job is to regard today, to go out and bring people to Christ bring people not to our political opinion, but to the truth of salvation in Christ. That is what we should be excited about. That is what we should campaign for. That is what we should promote. Standing together with our eyes closed. Heads are bowed. Again, as we take a quiet moment, 
difficult passage to preach. I'd much rather preach more stuff like we've preached in the last couple of weeks, but we need to know because we need to see the world as it is, not as we want it to be. And we need to know what the rest of the story is coming. It's happening. Will it come in our lifetimes? I don't know. Do I know the dates? No. Do I know the names? No. I don't need to. It's not necessary for me to know those things. All that's necessary for me to know is Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning? Have you trusted him as your Savior? Whether we're here or not, when the Antichrist rises and all this stuff happens is irrelevant. None of us are guaranteed a tomorrow, much less 10 years. Do you know Christ? If you were to die today, would you go to immediately to be with him in heaven? And the reality is you can know him and you can have everlasting life. You see, we've all sinned and we've all broken God's law. I have, you have, we all have. No one in this room is perfect. And if we were die, to die in that state, we'd die and, and become separated for God in a place called hell for eternity. But Jesus loved us anyway. Isn't that amazing? God loved us anyway. For additional sermon resources and to find out who we are, visit us online at westconcordchurch.com. Thanks for listening.